Between November 28th through the 30th, citizens of the Czech Republic had a unique opportunity to meet one of the most famous yet controversial journalists covering the Middle East. Gideon Levy, labeled as a security risk by his own state, called a traitor and a supporter of Hamas by his fellow citizens. At the same time, among numerous awards, the prize winner of the Peace Through Media Award in London, the man that has been described as the most heroic Israeli journalist by the independent newspaper and a powerful liberal voice by New York Times. He is here in the Czech Republic to share his experiences and opinions on the occupied territory of Gaza and the West Bank. And today we have the privilege of speaking to him firsthand. So welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, Mr. Levy, uh, are you in the Czech Republic for the first time or have you been here already? Is there something in particular about our nation or culture that interests you and why? Yes, it interests me a lot and it's not my first time. My first time was back in 1973. Mm -hmm. uh, you must know that uh, both my parents were born in Czech Republic. My mother was from Ostrava, from Moravska Ostrava. My father was from Zatetz. Mm -hmm. And I was brought up in Israel always with hearing good things about Czechoslovakia. It was always an example for a freedom fighting people, for people with art and culture and good food and many, many other things. So I am not indifferent. For me, it's not another country. For me, Czech Republic is the place where my parents were brought up, where they were born, where my grandparents were brought up, and therefore it has a special meaning for me to be here. Mm -hmm. And do you understand Czech language? Not even one word. My father, he came from Jatets, this was German then, so he speak, spoke only German. Mm -hmm. My mother spoke Czech and German, so we spoke at home German and not Czech, mm -hmm. because my father didn't speak Czech. So, And he studied in Prague, but he studied in German in the University of Prague. So, no, I don't understand. I, d I just know one word, which is Rukulibam. Rukulibam? Yes, that's <laughs> the only word I know in Czech. But it's an important one. It is important, <laughs> yeah. Okay. What is your main message you want to spread? My main message is that the Israeli occupation must come to its end. Mm -hmm. It's now 50 years next year that Israel is occupying another people in the most brutal way an occupation which is not recognized by one country in the world, an occupation which vi violates the international law, violates morality, violates, violates, violates justice. And I think that the world has to say its word, like the world fought against the apartheid system in South Africa and put an end to it. And without the world, the apartheid system would have continued. Same about the Israeli occupation. In 2010, you've published a book, The Punishment of Gaza, which consisted of your columns. How difficult is it to do such thing in Israel, where, uh, y you said it, uh, most of the population are against your ideas, government itself uh, is uh, opposing you, and, uh, uh, like, ha did you face any problems with that? For example, censorship, or your books being just burned, for example? No, no, I didn't like face that. this kind of problems. First of all, I didn't face any censorship. My newspaper backs me and mm -hmm. supports me and gives me full freedom. And it is, and the government never tried to stop me. Uh, because finally, Israel is a democracy for its Jewish citizen. And I'm a Jewish citizen of Israel. In the same time, it's very hard and very unpleasant for me, mainly in times of war, but also in other times, to walk in the streets of Tel Aviv or other cities because people recognize me and I get usually quite uh, unpleasant reactions, mm -hmm. side by side with other reactions which are very supportive, but they are a small minority. There were harder times like two years ago when I needed a bodyguard. 13 years ago, my car was shot by soldiers. They didn't know who is in the car. So, by and large, it is possible to raise your voice in Israel. At least for me, I can't complain. I raise my voice, nobody stops me, nobody can censor me, and I have full freedom of speech. 
and you are known for quite emotional and straightforward columns right. in Haaretz. Um, they, as you said, they caused you many problems from unpleasant mm -hmm. comments to or death threats. Does it worth it being in such a danger all the time? Did you regret anything you had written? I never regretted anything I written. Many times I regret uh, that I was not radical enough and not aggressive enough. If there is a regret, it's always on this direction, not on the opposite direction, never. Mm -hmm. And you say, does it worth it? Um, I don't know if it worth it because I don't know if I have any impact or any influence. I just know that I don't have any other choice because I believe in what I write. I cannot become a film critic or a restaurant critic. I can only write what I see and what I believe and what I think should be written. And my main issue is fighting the Israeli occupation and I cannot change it. So there is no alternative for me. I have to continue. When you go for such an emotional style, <coughs> it's actually easy to get involved emotionally in, in the conflict itself, like to be biased to towards Palestinians somehow. And uh, like maybe this is the reason why Israeli people are so skeptical towards your, if we can, can say so, towards your columns, that they feel that you don't uh, write about them uh, in the same way or in the same amount. Yeah, because the situation is not balanced. Mm -hmm. It's very clear who is the occupier. It's very clear who is the inhuman one. It's very clear who commits the crimes, the main crimes. It's very clear who runs this occupation, who is the strong one. And it's not two people, you know, a symmetry of two people who are fighting each other and I take side on one side and some other one takes side on the other side. Any man of conscience. Any man of justice cannot support an occupier. Mm -hmm. When the tanks came into your country in 68, you couldn't accept it. No people in the world accepted. No man of conscience accepted the Russian occupation of Czechoslovakia. It's exactly the same tanks who occupied Palestine. When we talk about the war, it cannot be black and white, right? It is black and white. When the Russian you know, invaded Czech Republic, was it black and white or not? For Russians, for example. <laughs> no, for you or for <laughs> any man of conscience. Any man of conscience in the world. I remember what we thought in Israel about what happened. Mm -hmm. There was one who supported the invasion. One man of conscience in the world said, yeah, the Russians should enter Prague. Black and white, very clear. Uh, in one of your interviews, you've said that Trump would be better president for Israel and Palestine, uh, or to be precise, you said that Clinton would be the worst. <laughs> that's that's the worst. Uh, yeah. As we see, the right wing of uh, politicians in Israel are really happy about him being elected, and uh, Palestinians are not that much. Uh, Trump actually he said that he would love to reach peace deal between these two nations, mm -hmm. but he's also known for his uh, you know highly contradictory statements. So, do you think his presidency will make a difference at the end? Nobody knows, and Donald Trump doesn't know. And because Donald Trump doesn't know where does he go, but nobody can tell what is going to happen. I wrote also that I was hoping that Donald Trump will win, and once he won, I got scared. Because it is frightening. I see the people that he is nominating. Most of them are really frightening people. I didn't think that Trump is a better person than, than Hillary Clinton. I just say that Hillary Clinton, we knew exactly what will she do in the Middle East. In other words, nothing. And I'm waiting for the one and only president of the United States who would really do something to put an end to the occupation. I knew that Clinton, no way she would do it. So I had some hope, maybe a childish hope, that uh, Donald Trump will deliver the goods. Right now I'm, I'm, I'm much more worried than anything else because I see those people, not only about the Middle East. Yeah. If you nominate a Secretary of Health who is against abortions, who is against healthcare, 
if you nominate all those fascist and racist, all kind of really key positions, you can be only fearful. We didn't get yet, we don't know yet who is the, s the Secretary of State mm -hmm. now, and we don't know yet what Donald Trump is, has intentions, what are his intentions. So still it is open. My hope was that he will once and for all stop the automatic support in Israel, the blind automatic support that whatever Israel is doing, the Americans are behind it. I was hoping, I still hope, that this will end. And uh, what about wildfires that started last Monday in uh, Israel? All the mass media talk about that, so The Guardian, CNN, BBC, RT. They all point out that some of them might have been politically motivated cases of arson. And uh, actually 14 people have already been arrested by Israeli police. What do you think about that? Is it really a revenge of Palestinians or some like new attempt to mm, remind the world of their suffer, or is it just a unfair blame of politicians? It's everything you say. It's everything <laughs> you say because we know by now that most of the fires were natural, mm -hmm. but there were most probably some which were in purpose. Until this very moment, we don't know how many. Many of those who were arrested were released because they were nothing, nothing against it. What really annoyed me was the incitement of the Israeli politicians. Immediately before they knew, much before anyone knew what happened, immediately they started to incite against the Palestinians and against the Israeli Arabs. And it showed again that those people have only one thing in their mind, and this is their nationalism and racism. Mm -hmm. Wherever they see some kind of potential for a fire, they light the fire, those politicians. The it fire of hatred. Absolutely. And what about young people? They are like basis of any change in society, mm -hmm. so we can only hope that they will do something. And what about Israeli young youth? What do they think about Palestinians and what is their attitude towards them? There's a small minority, very small minority in Israeli young generation who is fighting the occupation, who is devoted, who goes to protest, who refuse to serve in the army, who is ready to sacrifice, who is ready to really pay solidarity with the suffer of the Palestinian people, but they are very small in numbers. Very, very small. Groups like Breaking the Silence, which is a group of soldiers, Israeli soldiers, who after their service wants to speak out and to tell the crimes that they have committed together with their friends. But again, they are a small, small part of the young generation. Unfortunately, the majority of the young generation goes even more nationalistic and racist than their parents. Unfortunately, they are extremely ignorant. They know very little. They are totally brainwashed. And I don't see any hope for the young generation in Israel. And where is the problem? At schools or in media? Both. At school, in media, at home. Mm -hmm. The general atmosphere in Israel is becoming more and more racist and nationalistic. And the young generation is the first uh, product of this. We are now at the Faculty of Social Sciences where you can come across anybody from future politicians, uh, specialists on international res uh, relations, and to your future, I hope, uh, colleagues, journalists. Uh, do you have any um, advice for us as young and unexperienced uh, people that can change the world? Uh, is there anything that where you were uh, young, maybe you did something wrong and there was nobody to help you and direct. When I was young, I was as stupid, as brainwashed <laughs> as any young people were. And it's embarrassing for me to remember myself as a young boy in Tel Aviv. I was really a product of all the brainwash in the world. I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't have doubts. I was sure that everything that people tell me is true. 
And today I can only say the best thing, the best advice that I can tell young people is be doubtful. Don't buy everything that you are told that because you are told so many lies. In many fields, by the way. You must be critical and doubtful and suspicious because for many interests in many subjects you are not being told the truth and in order to find out the truth it's not enough only to buy whatever people try to feed you with because mainly it will be propaganda of all kinds of all kinds but not the truth that's the first thing and the second thing that i can say is that try to do things with meaning because you know, another night in a bar, and another night in a bar, we all did it, it's wonderful, but finally it is meaningless. And if you don't, I don't say not to do it, you don't become a, a, a monk. You, you live your life, but try always to find some kind of struggle. Some kind of struggle. It can be a struggle for Tibet, it can be a struggle for animal rights, it can be a struggle for Palestinian. It can be a struggle for, for, for women liberalization in your country. It can be for so many things. But to find an issue to struggle. Because otherwise the world will just go as it goes. And the last advice I can tell is go and become a journalist. Because I think it's a wonderful profession. I would never, never switch it with any other profession. So I'm happy I've chosen that. <laughs> you should be happy. This was my last question. Thank you very much for Thank being you. with us. Thank for you for having time. me. Thank <laughs> you. For Muniteva, Lucia Hilova and Anastasia Kryushenko.